so much for being here, for being part of Roots and Branches and what God is doing in this community. Even though we don't gather all in one place right now, we are gathered in spirit. And uh, I'm so thankful for all of you who tune in. I'm thankful for, for those of you that can like this video, to share it, and to start a watch party, because we believe this is something worth sharing that we're doing here at Roots and Branches. So if you're watching right now and you're enjoying it, please share away. And uh, I also want to let you know, uh, there's a link in the description of this video that takes you straight to our website, rootsandbranchesmn.org. And if you're new to the Roots and Branches community, uh, there's a link.
link there. You can click, it says contact us, and uh, we'll get your info. And then you can stay up to date on all the things that are happening in and through Roots and Branches. And that's also a great place if you uh, would like to make a donation to continue to support the work of Roots and Branches in this community. Um, there's a spot for that right on the website as well. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Colin Tanner. I'm the pastor at Roots and Branches. This is my wife, Jenny, and uh, she's our worship leader. And during this time, we've been doing a lot of these things, just us together. But we are still community, even though we're separated by distance. And so I want you to make the most of that comment space uh, in the Facebook video you're watching right now. Say hi. Uh, say, hey, I'm new here. And then you'll get greeted by a bunch of new friends. Um, this is, uh, I want you to share how you're seeing God in your life recently, whether it's in the weather, the rain, in people in your home or in your life, uh, or even if you're struggling and need prayer for something. Um, I want to encourage you to share. Be open and vulnerable in this space on the comments section because it's, it's a safe spot. And uh, we are here to support you and encourage you and be with you through it all. And I want to encourage you to turn your hearts to God with us again in song. You promise keeper, you promise keeper, you finish what
do open our hearts to you this morning. We know that you have been faithful in ages past, and you will be faithful in ages to come. And right here in this very present moment, we turn our minds and our hearts to you. May we open ourselves to your love and to the things that you want us to learn about our world, about ourselves, and about you. Help us to love you more and to witness you at work even today. Amen. Uh, this is the best we can do right now is have church spread far across uh, the, the, the wherever, this community and this country. Uh, I have friends that I know are watching right now from Iowa and from California and from all over the place, and I'm so glad that, you're, um, that you've joined us today for this moment. And I want to continue to encourage you to, to um, voice your presence, say, hello, I'm here, so that other people can say, I'm here too, and you can greet one another and uh, celebrate community in the ways that we are able to right now, uh, spread apart though we may be. I want to direct you again to the link in the description of this video that will take you to our website, rootsandbranchesmn.org, uh, where you can connect with us and you can make a donation if you feel led. Um, at Roots and Branches, we talk about how we are growing deeper in faith and reaching out in love. And so we do that in a lot of different ways, and I want you to hear about all those different ways. Um, in fact, if you uh, like us on Facebook, uh, you'll see in our videos, we recently released a video that, that explains all the different things that our church is still doing to love our neighbors during this difficult time. Uh, we are not going to let a pandep pandemic stop us from showing compassion, because uh, it's deeply ingrained in who we are as people of God, as people of faith, and as a church. So uh, thank you for uh, being a part of that, and thank you for being here today. Um, today we're starting a new series called What's Good? And we're going to be looking deeply into a single verse in the Bible for the next three weeks. It's Micah 6.8. And uh, we actually, I, I actually share that verse, the end of that verse, as the benediction, the closing of every single worship service we do at Roots and Branches. And it actually goes all the way back to my first Sunday as a pastor. Um, and that day... Uh, the senior pastor, I was an associate pastor, the senior pastor was gone that day, uh, and so I was, I was holding the bag for the whole worship service in a church that I wasn't familiar with, in a worship service, in a style that I was not uh, accustomed to, and uh, had it all planned out from beginning to end, and then I, at the very end, I was wearing a robe and the whole deal, and I walked to the front of the platform to give the benediction. That's the final blessing that commissions people to go with God's love, and I realized this is not a thing I was ready for. <laughs> I had not prepared. I didn't know what to say, and I said the first thing that came to my mind as something that I wanted to offer to people to know that God was going with them and that they were entering into uh, the work of God in the world, and I said, may you act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God. Amen. And it felt right. And so every worship service since then, that's how I've ended that, I've ended that time. And those words are powerful. And there's something deep within them that resonated with me and that has come to resonate with this community called Roots and Branches. And so we're going to look at each of these three little ideas embedded in that, acting justly, loving mercy, walking humbly with God. We're going to look at those over the next three weeks. Then we'll start today by asking what it really means to act justly. Because, um, you know, even though these words stand alone so nicely, they actually come from somewhere. Um, so I'm going to read the first couple of verses that lead into that phrase uh, in Micah 6, 8. So I'm starting in Micah chapter 6, verse 6, and it says, With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings, with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? And then the response is, he has told you, human one, what is good, what the Lord requires from you to do justice, embrace faithful love, 
and walk humbly with God. So Micah asks this question of God. He wants to know how God wants to be worshipped. How, how am I going to get forgiveness for the things that I've done wrong? And so Micah names the practices that were most common in his day, the practices that were prescribed in the, for the Hebrew people in their Bible. And Micah wonders out loud, what, what if that's not enough? What if, I, what if I do the normal acts of worship and that's not enough because my sins are so grievous that I, what should I do? Should I sacrifice thousands of rams? Should I pour out barrels and barrels of olive oil as a sacrifice to God? And then he goes one step further. He says, should I sacrifice my own child so that I can be forgiven? And, and in this particular instance, Micah actually gets a reply from God. And even though there's a divine list of do's and don'ts that you're supposed to do that are all describing what God wants from us in the Hebrew Bible, God's reply to Micah is this, to do justice, to embrace faithful love, and to walk humbly with your God. That's all the worship God wants. That's the real sacrifice. That's the real practice of religion. That's what's good. And that's why this sermon series is called What's Good? Because God says, you know what is good, Micah. And then he names these three things that are the good things that are the actual practice of a person of faith. And we're going to take the next three weeks wading deep in these waters, and we're going to start with this phrase, act justly. Or as some translations say, do justice. And I like that a lot. Um, when we think of justice, our minds first go to the justice, the justice system. We think of courts and judges. Uh, there's Judge Judy, there's Judge Wapner. All, all those cop shows, uh, every version of Law and Order and CSI, uh, they've created our perception of what the justice system is and what it does. We think of systems and individuals that hand out justice, making restitution uh, for those who have been wrong wronged and also making sure that people get what they deserve punishment for the guilty and but when the bible talks about justice there's a whole lot more going on there than what happens in a courtroom um, the hebrew hebrew word that is written here in micah that gets translated as justice is the word mishpat and uh, mishpat is a word that occurs over 200 times in the hebrew bible and basically means that you need to treat people equitably, especially as it pertains to people's rights. And the people whose rights are most likely to be violated are the people who are most in need of mishpat. And so throughout the Hebrew Bible, this word mishpat is most often used in reference to the most vulnerable, widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. Because those people in those groups are the most likely to go without the, uh, the most likely to go without. They're the most likely to get trampled on by the powerful. And it's the duty of God's people to act toward them with mishpat, with justice, with equity. And today, we could probably expand this group beyond just um, widows, orphans, immigrants, the poor. There's more people who are also vulnerable on the edges of society. Uh, who are the people that have been completely upended by the pandemic, the people who even the slightest change in our society affects the most. I'd add to this list people like refugees, people without homes, uh, maybe the elderly, single parents. All of these groups need an extra dose of mishpat so that everyone can live into this world fully. But how is it? Here's this crazy thing in this Bible verse. It's, it says that doing justice, caring for the least and the last and the left out, that that becomes something that God wants from us more than worship. And for like church people like me, th that sounds off. It can be a little dumbfounding at first because we're often trained that the thing that God wants from us the most is to go to church and to give our offerings to church and to serve at church. But it sounds to me like this is an invitation to go out and serve others, 
who are maybe not in your church, maybe who you aren't even comfortable around. And it's dumbfounding at first, but it makes all the sense in the world when we think about the character of God. This characteristic of justice is an essential part of who God is. Um, Psalm 68 introduces God as a father to the fatherless, a defender of windows, of widows. Like, that's God's title. Like, that would be if God had a name tag and then a job description under it. That's what it would be, father of the fatherless, defender of widows, according to Psalm um, 68. And so when we reflect on that characteristic, when we, when we reflect that characteristic in our own lives, we're living in harmony with our Creator. When we're looking out for the disadvantaged, we are doing something that is deeply spiritual. Another Old Testament prophet, Amos, wrote that when we aren't creating justice in the world, our songs of praise to God are just noise. Whatever other sacrifices we make to God, they're just a waste. And the truth in, in Amos is that we don't prove that our worship to God is sincere by, by closing our eyes or by lifting our hands or by singing louder than everyone else. We show that our worship to God is sincere by living a life in rhythm with our Creator. And that means working to create a just world. On February 23rd, Ahmaud Arbery was shot and killed by two men. And that fact has never been under dispute. The shooters didn't deny it. But it wasn't until a video of the incident went viral that the justice system finally took the incident seriously. These shooters were finally taken into custody on May 7th. That's 73 days that these men were walking around free, even though they'd killed someone in broad daylight. Please remember that they weren't arrested because the police saw the video. They were arrested because we saw the video. This killing didn't reveal the cruelty of just these two men. It also revealed the cruelty that can be embedded in a system we call the justice system. Meanwhile, Mostly white protesters brandishing semi-automatic weapons are crowding state legislatures, implicitly threatening lawmakers and preventing governments from doing the much-needed work that has to happen for our society to adapt and function during this pandemic. And why do I hold these two things right next to each other? And it's because the reason these protesters feel safe is because they can count on being seen as fully-fledged people. And the reason that jogging while black is apparently punishable that by death is that if you're not white, your fundamental personhood isn't assumed in the same way in our society. And so if one of the main ways we reflect our love of God is through working for justice, we have got a long way to go. Those of us with voices and with privilege have to use it to benefit those who don't whether it's speaking up for justice or supporting those who do the speaking up and the acting. It's, it's the core of what it means to be the people of God. It shows up again and again throughout our Bible, and, it's, and that's because it, it isn't a distraction from our relationship with God. It is the heart of our relationship with God. That's why at Roots and Branches, we're committed to growing deeper in faith and reaching out in love. That's the roots and the branches. The and in roots and branches is really essential because we need the roots of faith to give the branches of justice meaning and nourishment. And we need the branches of justice. They're going to be a natural outgrowth of the life of faith when it's authentic. And the roots and branches at this church aren't just metaphorical anymore either. Uh, we've taken out two plots in the community garden right next door to our church so that we can work together to grow produce to share with our neighbors in need. And if you want to help with that, we've got a Facebook group, uh, Roots and Branches Community Garden, I think it's called, and you can join that and find ways that you can help, uh, help us garden. And a garden really is a great way to think about doing justice. Like a garden, the work of justice means getting your hands dirty. 
It can be hard work. It requires a lot of patience and investment. And sometimes the seeds of justice we sow now, we don't see the fruit from them for a long time. Also, the work of justice works better when the whole community comes together to make it happen. But in the end, the fruit it bears is so very worth it. So uh, in the comments section of this video, I want to encourage you to have a conversation about justice. What justice, what, what causes of justice break your heart? And how might God be calling you to action because of that? What are you already doing to work for justice? And what new thing are you going to do to make justice a reality? Now, as we were singing our opening song today, Your Love is Strong, the ending words are uh, the Lord's Prayer. And, and within these words that Christians throughout the ages and throughout geography pray every single Sunday, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the ancient belief about what heaven is like is it's the next world where everything is complete, where everyone has enough, where everything is whole and beautiful, and where the truth is seen plain as day. And when, when we pray those words, your kingdom come, your will be done, we, we could sit back and wait for God to do that, for God to enforce God's will, for God to drop the kingdom down on us from heaven. But if that's what we want, if that's what we pray, what's stopping us from doing it right now? As a, as a show of our spirituality, we get our hands dirty. As a show of our genuine faith, we go to work realizing the kingdom of God right now as we work together for justice. Like Micah says, you already know what's good, and it starts with acting for justice. Pray with me. God, we turn our hearts to you. We know that when it comes to justice in this world, we so often fall short. We're guilty of sitting back and watching instead of jumping in. It's easier to scroll by things on our Facebook feed that are distracting and distasteful than it is to, to jump in and do what we can because it feels like the problems are so big and we're so small. But God, you are not small at all. Your love is strong enough for us. And so we rest there. We ask that you work within us as individuals and as a community to make your justice known. Amen. We're going to sing one last song today. It's called Reckless Love, which I know many, many, many people know this by now. And I just want to speak truth in your life that if you feel overwhelmed, lonely, separated, far from God, that is not reality. It is not the truth. Um, that God loves you deeply and recklessly. And God is willing to go to such lengths to have you feel loved and to realize your importance and worth in God's eyes. It's just we need to wake up and recognize. We need to wake up and recognize that we are loved by God and we are children of God and adored by God. And the simple fact that you are here, breathing, living, and existing, God loves you.
your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so Throughout this week, until we meet again, whether in person or online, may God stir within you, giving you the strength and courage to act justly and love mercy. Walk humbly with God.